happy Monday, everybody. So here we are, I'm going to read a few more chapters in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl. Um, I'm Miss Erin at the Caribou Public Library. So if you'll recall, we have read the, most recently um, about square candies that look round. Did you guys figure out what they meant and why that was something? Because <laughs> they weren't round, but they looked round. They looked round. Okay, so we have Aruka Salt, Mike TV, and Charlie Bucket that are left in the tour of Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Veruca in the Nut Room, Chapter 24. Mr. Wonka rushed on down the corridor, the Nut Room, it said, on the next door they came to. All right, said Mr. Wonka, stop here for a moment and catch your breath. Take a peek through the glass panel of this door, but don't go in. Whatever you do, don't go into the Nut Room. If you go in, you'll disturb the squirrels. Everyone crowded around the door. Oh, look, Grandpa, look, cried Charlie. Squirrels, shouted Veruca Salt. Jeepers, said Mike TV. It was an amazing sight. The one, oh, 100 squirrels were seated upon high stools around a large table. On the table, there were mounds and mounds of walnuts, and the squirrels were all working away like mad, shelling the walnuts at a tremendous speed. These squirrels are specially trained for getting the nuts out of walnuts, Mr. Wonka explained. Why use squirrels, Mike TV asked. Why not use Oompa Loompas? Because, said Mr. Wonka, Oompa Loompas can't get walnuts out of walnut shells in one piece. They always break them in two. Nobody except squirrels can get walnuts whole out of a walnut shell every time. It is extremely difficult. But in my factory, I insist upon using only whole walnuts. Therefore, I have to have squirrels to do the job. Aren't they wonderful the way they get those nuts out? And see how they first tap each walnut with their knuckles to be sure it's not a bad one. If it is bad, it makes a hollow sound and they don't bother to open it. They just throw it down the garbage chute. There, look, watch that squirrel nearest to us. I think he's got a bad one now. They watched the little squirrel as he tapped the walnut shell with his knuckles. He cocked his head to one side, listening intently, and then suddenly he threw the walnut over his shoulder into a large hole on the floor. Hey, mummy, shouted Veruca Salt suddenly. I've decided I want a squirrel. Get me one of those squirrels. Don't be silly, sweetheart, said Mrs. Salt. These all belong to Mr. Wonka. I don't care about that, shouted Veruca. I want one. All I've, all I've got at home is two dogs and four cats and six bunny rabbits, two parakeets and three canaries and a green parrot and a turtle and a bowl of goldfish and a cage of white mice and a silly old hamster. I want a squirrel. All right, my pet. Mrs. Salt said soothingly, Mommy will get you a squirrel just as soon as she possibly can. But I don't want any old squirrel, Veruca shouted. I want a train squirrel. At this point, Mr. Salt, Veruca's father, stepped forward. Very well, Mr. Wonka, he said importantly, taking out a wallet full of money. How much do you want for one of these crazy squirrels? Name your price. They're not for sale, Mr. Wonka answered. She can't have one. Who says I can't, shouted Veruca. I'm going in to grab me a squirrel this very minute. Don't, said Mr. Wonka quickly, but he was too late. The girl had already thrown open the door and rushed in. The moment she entered the room, 100 squirrels stopped what they were doing and turned their heads and stared at her with small black beady eyes. Veruca Salt stopped also and stared back at them. Then her gaze fell upon a pretty little squirrel sitting nearest to her at the end of the table. The squirrel was holding a walnut in its paws. All right, Veruca said, I'll have you. She reached out her hands to grab the squirrel, but as she did so, in that first split second when her hands started to go forward, there was a sudden movement, a flash of movement in the room, like a flash of brown lightning, and every single squirrel around the table took a flying leap towards her and landed on her body. Twenty-five of them caught hold of her right arm and pinned it down. Twenty-five more caught hold of her left arm and pinned that down. Twenty-five. Um, 25 more caught hold of her right leg and anchored it to the ground. 24 caught hold of her left leg. And the one remaining squirrel, obviously the leader of them all, climbed up onto her shoulder and started tap, tap, tapping the wretched girl's head with its knuckles. Save her, screamed Mrs. Salt. Veruca, come back. What are they doing to her? They're testing her to see if she's a bad nut, said Mr. Wonka. You watch. Veruca struggled furiously, but the squirrels held her tight and she couldn't move. The squirrel on her shoulder went tap, tap, tapping the side of her head with his knuckles. Then all at once, 
the squirrel pulled Veruca to the ground and started carrying her across the floor. My goodness, she is a bad nut after all, said Mr. Wonka. Her head must have sounded quite hollow. Veruca kicked and screamed, but it was no use. The tiny strong paws held her tightly and she couldn't escape. Where are they taking her, shrieked Mrs. Salt. She's going where all the other bad nuts go, said Mr. Willy Wonka, down the garbage chute. By golly, she is going down the chute, said Mr. Salt, staring through the glass door at his daughter. Then save her, cried Mrs. Salt. Too late, she's gone, Miss, said Mr. Wonka, and indeed she had. But where, shrieked Mrs. Salt, flapping her arms, what happens to the bad nuts? Where does the chute go? That particular chute, Mr. Wonka told her, runs directly into the great big main garbage pipe, which carries away all the rubbish from every part of the factory. All the floor sweepings and potato peelings and rotten cabbages and fish heads and stuff like that. Who eats fish and cabbage and potatoes in this factory, I'd like to know, said Mike TV. I do, of course, answered Mr. Wonka. You don't think I live on cocoa beans, do you? But, 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 shrieked Mrs. Salt, where does the great big pipe go to in the end? Why, to the furnace, of course, Mr. Wonka said calmly, to the incinerator. Mrs. Salt opened her huge red mouth and started to scream. <gasps> Don't worry, said Mr. Wonka. There's always a chance that they've decided not to light it today. A chance, yelled Mrs. Salt. My darling Veruca, she'll, she'll be sizzled like a sausage. Quite right, my dear, said Mr. Salt. Now, see here, Wonka, he added. I think you've gone just a shade too far this time. I do indeed. My daughter may be a bit of a frump, I don't mind admitting it, but that doesn't mean you can roast her to a crisp. I'll have you know I'm extremely cross about this. I really am. Oh, don't be cross, my dear sir, said Mr. Wonka. I expect she'll turn up again sooner or later. She may not even have gone down at all. She may be stuck in the chute just below the entrance hole, and if that's the case, all you have to do is go in and pull her up again. Hearing this, both Mr. and Mrs. Salt dashed into the nut room and ran over to the hole in the floor and peered in. <laughs> Here they are yelling at Mr. Wonka ah! and looking into the hole. Veruca, shouted Mrs. Salt, are you down there? There was no answer. Mrs. Salt bent further forward to get a better look. She was now kneeling right on the edge of the hole with her head down and her enormous behind sticking up in the air like a giant mushroom. It was a dangerous position to be in. She needed only one tiny little push, one gentle nudge in the right place. And that is exactly what the squirrels gave her. Over she toppled into the hole head first, screeching like a parrot. Good gracious me, said Mr. Salt as he watched his fat wife go tumbling down the hole. What a lot of garbage there's going to be today. He saw her disappearing into the darkness. What is it like down there, Gina? He called out and he leaned further forward. Yikes. The squirrels rushed up behind him. Help, he shouted, but he was already toppling forward and down the chute he went, just as his wife had done before him and his daughter. Oh dear, cried Charlie, who was watching with the others through the door. What on earth's going to happen to them now? I expect someone will catch them at the bottom of the chute, said Mr. Wonka. But what about the great fiery incinerator, asked Charlie. There's only, they only light it every other day, said Mr. Wonka. Perhaps this is one of the days when they let it go out. You never know. They might be lucky. Shh, said Grandpa Joe. Listen, here comes another song. From far away down the corridor came the beating of drums, and then the singing began. Baruka Salt, sang the Oompa Loompas. Veruca Salt, the little brute, has just gone down the garbage chute, and as we very rightly thought that in a case like this we ought to see the thing completely through, we've polished off her parents too. Down goes Veruca down the drain, and here perhaps we should explain that she will meet as she descends a rather different set of friends. To those that she has left behind, these won't be nearly so refined. A fish head, for example, cut this morning from a halibut. Hello, good morning, how do you do? How nice to meet you, how are you? And then a little further down, a mass of others gather round. A bacon rind, some rancid lard, a loaf of bread gone stale and hard, a steak that nobody could chew, an oyster from an oyster stew. Some liver were so old and gray, one smelled it from a mile away. 
a rotten nut, a reeky pear, the thing that the cat left on the stair, and lots of other things as well, each with a rather horrid smell. These are Veruca's newfound friends that she will meet as she descends, and this is the price she has to pay for going so very far astray. But now, my dears, we think you might be wondering, is it really right that every single bit of blame and all the scolding and the shame should fall upon Veruca Salt? Is she the only one at fault? For though she spoiled and dreadfully so, a girl can't spoil herself, you know. Who spoiled her then, and who indeed? Who pandered to her every need? Who turned her into such a brat? Who are the culprits? Who did that? Alas, you needn't look so far to find out who these sinners are. They are, and this is very sad, our loving parents, mum and dad. And that is why we're glad they fell into the garbage chute as well. <laughs> Chapter 25, The Great Glass Elevator. I've never seen anything like it, cried Mr. Wonka. The children are disappearing like rabbits, but you mustn't worry about it. They'll all come out in the wash. Mr. Wonka looked as the little group that stood beside him in the corridor. There were only two children left now, Mike TV and Charlie Bucket. And there were three grown-ups, Mr. and Mrs. TV and Grandpa Joe. Shall we move on? Mr. Wonka asked. Oh, yes, cried Charlie and Grandpa Joe both together. My feet are getting tired, said Mike TV. I'm going to watch television. If you're tired, then we'd better take the elevator, said Mr. Wonka. It's over here. Come on, in we go. He skipped across the passage to a pair of double doors. The doors slid open and the two children and grown-ups went in. Now then, cried Mr. Wonka, which button shall we press first? Take your pick. Charlie Bucket stared around him in astonishment. This was the craziest elevator he'd ever seen. There were buttons everywhere. The walls and even the ceiling were covered all over with rows and rows and rows of small black push buttons. There must have been a thousand of them on each wall and another thousand on the ceiling. And now Charlie noticed that every single button had a tiny printed label beside it, telling you which room you would be taken to if you pressed it. This isn't just an ordinary up and down elevator, announced Mr. Wonka proudly. This elevator can go sideways and long ways, slant ways and any other ways you can think of. It can visit any single room in the whole factory, no matter where it is. You simply press the button and zing, you're off. <gasps> Fantastic, murmured Grandpa Joe. His eyes were shining with excitement as he stared at the rows and rows of buttons. The whole elevator is made of thick, clear glass, Mr. Wonka declared. Walls, doors, ceilings, floor, everything is made of glass so that you can see out. Oh, excuse me, but there's nothing to see, said Mike TV. Choose a button, said Mr. Wonka. The two children may press one button each, so take your pick. Hurry up, in every room something delicious and wonderful is being made. Quickly, Charlie started reading some of the labels along the buttons. Mm, what are some of the labels? The Rock Candy Mine, 10,000 feet deep, it said in one. Corner Nut, Coker Nut Ice Skating Rinks, it said on another. Then, strawberry juice water pistols, toffee apple trees for planting out in your garden, all sizes. Exploding candy for your enemies. Luminous lollies for eating in bed at night. Mint jujubes for the boy next door. They'll give him green teeth for a month. <laughs> Cavity filling caramels, no more dentists. Stick jaw for talkative parents. Wriggle sweets that wriggle delightfully in your tummy after swallowing. Ooh. Invisible chocolate bars for eating in class. Candy coated pencils for sucking. Fizzy lemonade swimming pools. Magic hand fudge. When you hold it in your hand, you taste it in your mouth. Rainbow drops. Suck them and you can spit in six different colors. <laughs> come on, come on, cried Mr. Wonka. We can't wait all day. Isn't there a television room in all this lot? Asked Mike TV. Certainly there's a television room, Mr. Wonka said. That button over there, he pointed with his finger. Everybody looked. Television chocolate, it said on the tiny label beside the button. Whoopee, shouted Mike TV. That's for me. He stuck out his thumb and pressed the button. 
Instantly, there was a tremendous whizzing noise. The doors uh, clanged shut, and the elevator leapt away as though it had been stung by a wasp. But it leapt sideways, and all the passengers, except Mr. Wonka, who was holding to a strap from the ceiling, were flung off their feet onto the floor. Get up, get up, cried Mr. Wonka, roaring with laughter. But just as they were staggering to their feet, the elevator changed directions and swerved violently around a corner, and over they went once more. Ah, here they are, standing in the elevator. And there's a Willy Wonka holding on, and everybody else getting whacked around. <laughs> ah, let's see. Get up, get up, cried Mr. Wonka, roaring with laughter. Oh, I already read that part. <laughs> It changed directions and swerved violently around a corner, and over they went once more. Help! shouted Mrs. TV. Take my hand, madame, said Mr. Wonka gallantly. There you are. Now grab this strap. Everybody grab a strap. The journey's not over yet. Old Grandpa Joe staggered to his feet and caught hold of a strap. Little Charlie, who couldn't possibly reach as high as that, put his arms around Grandpa Joe's legs and hung on tight. The elevator rushed on at the speed of a rocket. Now it was beginning to climb. It was shooting up, 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 and a steep slanty course as if it were climbing a very steep hill. Then suddenly, as though it had come to the top of the hill and gone over a precipice, it dropped like a stone and Charlie felt his tummy coming right up into his throat. Grandpa Joe shouted, yippee, here we go. And Mrs. TV cried out, the rope is broken, we're going to crash. Mr. Wonka said, calm yourself, my dear lady, and patted her comfortingly on the arm. And then Grandpa Joe looked down at Charlie, who was clinging to his legs, and said, Are you all right, Charlie? Charlie shouted, I love it. It's like being on a roller coaster. And through the glass walls of the elevator, as it rushed along, they caught sudden glimpses of strange and wonderful things going on in some of the other rooms. An enormous spout with brown sticky stuff oozing out of it onto the floor. Hmm. A great craggy mountain made entirely of fudge, with Oompa Loompas all roped together for safety hacking huge chunks of fudge out of its sides. A mach machine with white powder sprang out of it like a snowstorm. A lake of hot caramel with steam coming off of it. A village of Oompa Loompas with tiny houses and streets and hundreds of Oompa Loompa children no more than four inches high playing in the streets. And now the elevator began flattening out again, but it seemed to be going faster than ever, and Charlie could hear the scream of the wind outside as it hurtled forward, and it twisted, it turned, it went up, it went down, and I'm going to be sick, yelled Mrs. TV, turning green in the face. Please don't be sick, said Mr. Wonka. Try and stop me, said Mrs. TV. Then you better take this, said Mr. Wonka, and he swept his magnificent black top hat off of his head and held it upside down in front of Mrs. TV's mouth. Ooh. Make this awful thing stop, ordered Mr. TV. I can't do that, said Mr. Wonka. It won't stop until we get there. I only hope no one's using the other elevator at this moment. What other elevator? screamed Mrs. TV. The one that goes the opposite way on the same track as this one, said Mr. Wonka. Holy mackerel, cried Mr. TV. You mean we might have a collision? I've always been lucky so far, said Mr. Wonka. Now I am going to be sick, yelled Mrs. TV. No, no, said Mr. Wonka, not now. We're nearly there. Don't spoil my hat. The next moment, there was a screaming of brakes and the elevator began to slow down. Then it stopped altogether. Some ride, said Mr. TV, wiping his great sweaty face with a handkerchief. Never again, gasped Mrs. TV. And then the doors of the elevator slid open and Mr. Wonka said, Just a minute now, listen to me. I want every to be very everybody to be very careful in this room. There is dangerous stuff around in here and you must not tamper with it. <laughs> that is all we're going to read for today. Next time we will start off with the television chocolate room. Have a great night.